It's 37 degrees. I'm Barry Gilrace, and this is Fabric of Family. We came on a Sunday. Part of the Bible was back part of what I do as a The prodigal son. This is a story in the Bible that we're all familiar with if we've spent any time at all uh, studying our Bibles. We've heard it in sermons, we've studied it in Bible classes, and in our own private devotion. It is a beautiful parable of Christ that demonstrates the great grace and mercy and love of God. But you know, there are also some applications that we can make from this parable to our family relationship. And you know, that's what this program's really all about. Fabric of Family is a program addressed uh, that addresses family needs from a biblical perspective. And so we want to thank you for joining us today for this program. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment. Heavenly song, thank you for viewing the Fabric song, of Family. Flooding my soul with if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is 1031 Hermitage Drive in Florence, Alabama, 35630. Or you may contact us at our website, jhcc.org. That's jhcc.org. Or you can call us at 256 764 Six two nine one. His praise is Jesus is mine. In the That's two five six seven six four six two nine one. Two mansions above, singing His praises gladly. I'm walking. Our hope walking and prayer is to bring you and your family closer Jesus to God. It's time for our panel discussion, and with us today, David Smith, who preaches for the North Hamilton Church of Christ. And uh, this is uh, located over in uh, Saudi, and uh, it's, this is on the outskirts of Chattanooga, Tennessee. If you're one of our viewers in another area of the country, just to give you some perspective of where uh, this uh, congregation is. And also we have with us uh, Jameson Stewart. Jameson preaches for the West Hobbs Church of Christ, and this is in Athens, Alabama, not too far uh, from Huntsville, just uh, west of Huntsville. Glad to have both of these men with us. They've been with us in uh, previous programming, and we're talking about the prodigal son, and specifically as it relates to every parent's uh, fear, that is, Christian parents' fear, uh, to actually live out this parable in their own life, having a child that that becomes a uh, prodigal. Uh, we're going to talk about this uh, this parable just a bit, and I- I'm going to ask our guests just to kind of rehearse this with us uh, to kind of review the, the story uh, that before we actually get into some of these questions. But before they do that, uh, this is a parable. Sure. And Jesus used parables in his teaching, but maybe it would be helpful to define what a parable is. Jameson, if someone were to ask you, what is a parable, uh, what would you say? I've heard it described as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's, it's basically, it's an illustration with a spiritual principle that's being driven home. Okay. Good definition. David, anything to add? No, no, no. It's just, I mean, it's just, you have to appreciate the wisdom of it. It, it, Mm. What we would do in teaching others, we would take everyday common knowledge objects or events or activities, and we you tell a story or use the, the, the activity or the object, whatever it is, and then you make the spiritual principle, and so it's, it becomes easily relatable. And I think what he said, earthly story with a heavenly meaning, is just that. It's something that we have common knowledge of, and we apply a spiritual principle, and it just sticks. And you have to appreciate the wisdom of the Lord in, in teaching that way. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, the prodigal son. I'll just turn it over to David. David, kind sure. of tell us uh, a little bit about the, the parable. Yeah, well, there's a series of three parables in Luke chapter 15. They all start with Jesus eating with the tax collectors and the sinners, and he draws critique from the Pharisees, and each of those three parables is a response to Mm -hmm. the Pharisees in that situation. They're all about lost things that are found and the joy of God and finding lost things. It just happens that in our parable today, it's a lost boy. Mm. And so it starts out 
uh, with the youngest of the two sons uh, asking for something that shouldn't have been his until after the death of his father, which is sort of an insult to his it, father. Oh, very saying, much so. Yeah. Essentially saying, I wish you were already dead and yeah. I could have my things. And he takes it. And uh, we're all familiar with him squandering his possessions away. He did. And, um, and then he sort of has a, a come to himself moment, you know, where he thinks deeply and he realizes that in his father's house, even servants are treated better than what his current condition is, eating, you know, with the pigs. And uh, so he returns and the father is waiting for him. And you see elements of restoration. And uh, so there's great rejoicing when he comes home. Yeah. And, and then it kind of shifts from uh, that son to the response of the other son. Jameson finishes out. And the older brother sort of once he, you know, he hears this celebration happening back at home. He, he's coming in, I guess, from, you know, working out in the field that day, whatever it was, tending to, you know, their property, their their investments that they had. And he realized the servant came, your younger brother, the, the prodigal son has come home. The older brother's angry because his father has done all this for the one who wasted his father's possessions while he, the older brother, He's been there actually taking care of what his father had. Yeah. And his father came out and reminded him right. something that's been lost. We should celebrate it being found, which connects all the way back to the attitude of the Pharisees at the beginning of this chapter. So what are some spirit before we get into applying this to, to the home, what are some more general spiritual applications that this parable is teaching us? Well, I think Jameson kind of hinted at it just a moment ago that every parable has a main point. Okay. But there could be tons yeah. of other principles involved because you, especially the story, the longer it is, the more common everyday objects you mm -hmm. use, the more principles there are. Um, but as he just mentioned, you go back to verses 1 and 2, and Jesus is really driving home that there's joy in forgiveness. When you have lost people who are found, you, this it ought to be a moment of incredible joy. And you see it with the lost coin, the lost sheep, and now you see it in the in the parable of the lost boy who finds forgiveness with his father. So the parable sort of revolves around the principle of forgiveness. It's open to all right. as long as they take advantage right. of it. Right. And, and we don't want to miss the application that, that's being made there by Jesus, uh, talking about the uh, the spiritual uh, return of, of those who are his sure. children. Uh, you know, that's teaching us about God's grace, God's love, sure. God's mercy. Yeah. But as has been pointed out, there are also some other applications sure. we can make even to the uh, the earthly home, mm -hmm. yeah. the parent-child relationship. And that's what we want to uh, to spend really the rest of our, our time in our discussion talking about. And uh, what are some of those uh, lessons that we learn from this parable as it relates to the home? What are some things that come to your mind? Well, and it's... As a as a parent with young children, it's a it's a reality, not a reality that I guess I really look forward to, but it's a reality that eventually, at some point, likely my children are going to make some rather poor choices. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's not as it, yeah, it may not be to the same degree, right? But all parents are going to experience this, aren't they? Uh, in, yeah. in the sense that their children are going to go, you know, go astray to some degree yeah. as they're trying to teach them and rear them. Uh, and of course, as our children get older, we, there, there are more consequences that, that they, as well as the, the parents and others suffer because of these choices. Yeah. And, and just in reading this and, and knowing that, um, I suppose as a parent, it also, gives me some guidance too on how, you know, when this happens, you know, what are some principles then that we learn is, well, what I see from the father is that that celebration when the child does come back and does sure. make things right. There's no, there's no grudges held by the father. You know, there's no, uh, this constant reminding of the younger son of what a poor choice he made. And think about how many years you lost because it's just, you're back. I want to celebrate that. You're home, and I'm so glad you're here. And, and what a lesson for a parent is when a child does wander off and they come back, be ready to welcome them like this, because this is how God welcomes his children, sinners, who mm -hmm. come back to him. Yeah. David? No, I just think what Jamison said is as a parent, it's really scary to, to know that at some point your kids 
are going to make those choices and they may not be good choices. Mm-hmm. You know, there's two stories, this one and I think the one in, in Job. Um, at the beginning of, of Job, it, you know, you read that story and, and the devil went straight after Job's kids. Yeah. And I think, you know, the devil, the devil does not love your kids and he's going to, if he can, he's going to destroy them. And now you have Jesus saying in, in a, in a parable, you know, the devil's going to destroy your kids if he can do it. And sometimes he does do it. And when that happens, here's what potentially can happen. Mm-hmm. And it can be a good ending to the story. But I think as a parent, you grieve the day when it comes that sin enters their life and they're, estranged from God, and you hope that they can fix that before it's too late. Yeah. There have been many parents who, who have suffered greatly because of, of children who've gone astray. Uh, and as we said, this can happen at, at any age in our, our children's lives uh, to, to a certain degree. Uh, you know, um, here, here's a, here are parents of a young child, and, and maybe this, uh, this young child, while mom and dad are in the the grocery store uh, has an opportunity they see to take some candy and put it in their pocket. And, uh, you know, then uh, when mom and dad leave, they leave with them. And then in the car, they're sitting in the back of the car eating the candy. And mm-hmm. mom and dad want to know, well, where did this come from? Well, I mean, this this is a matter of degree. Uh, we understand. Um, but yet that's a teaching moment parents can use sure. uh, in, in order to help uh, bring about penance. Uh, on the part of of their children, uh, but um, these are things we need to think about. Um, and you know, as our children get older, uh, sometimes they can make decisions that can have even uh, greater consequences upon their life. But parents sometimes struggle with this. They struggle with guilt. They struggle over choices their children have made, and they blame themselves. Um, is it the case? And I'm, I, you know, I'm not looking for uh, one particular answer here. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out. Is it the case that parents are to blame for the choices their children are making? Sometimes. Okay. Sometimes. And we all know parents who have enabled bad behavior in their kids mm-hmm. and endorsed it, but sometimes not. Yeah. You know, I think, and I'm. You know, we we think of Proverbs twenty two six. It's not a it's not an absolute. Sometimes kids mm-hmm. do go astray. They they might be anchored in their mind to the truth, but they do go astray. And I always, you know, I'm not ashamed to say that um, I I did that when I was in the military. I went as far almost as you could get away from God, and it wasn't any fault of my mother and father because I was raised um, around the church. I, you know, I was involved. Uh, they taught us the Bible more than just on Sunday and Wednesday nights. They had us involved, mm-hmm. and they taught us, and they tried to make application in everyday life. And I got around the, the wrong people in the military, and I was I was nearly atheistic. I just didn't mm-hmm. believe in much, and I, you know, I worked my way back because I was anchored. But I I cannot at any moment say this is the fault of my mother and father that I did right. this. It was just poor choices on my part, and they grieved over it. They yeah. grieved my condition. But um, but it was not their fault. So I, I would say the answer is sometimes, mm, sometimes. If, if parents do enable that, and sometimes parents do, but sometimes not. Right. They're no perfect parents, right? That's right. And uh, anyone who's been a parent very long at all will <laughs> readily admit that and recognize that. Uh, and so we make mistakes. Sometimes the uh, the things we say or the things we do, the example we set, may be a contributing factor to a decision that our children make. But then, as you know, David's pointed out, sometimes uh, you know we could, we could give them the the best of uh, a Christian education, the best of instruction, the best of training, and it still comes down to the fact that you know choose you this day whom you're That's going right. to serve. We we have free will, mm-hmm. and you know, as a, a child, I can't blame my parents and say, well, the reason that I turned out like I did is because of my parents. Well. You know, uh, you can have uh, two children brought up in the very same household who can make uh, totally different decisions sure. about about their life. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that I, I suppose the the correct answer to that question is uh, yes and no. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Lot Lot was a righteous man, the Bible calls him, but he lost almost all of his kids. I mean, they yeah. made their own choice with Sodom. Yeah. But the Bible still calls him a righteous man. So. Yeah. You know, any any set of circumstances can affect a decision, and it yeah. may not be the right one. 
Well, this is a good discussion, and we're going to continue this, but we're going to take a short break. Harrison Chastain, who is uh, the preacher for the Jackson Heights Church of Christ, Florence, Alabama. Jackson Heights oversees Fabric of Family, by the way. Appreciate them. Uh, but Harrison's going to do a short segment on uh, the husband's responsibility to love his wife. So let's watch that together, then we'll come back and wrap up our discussion. All gave some, but some gave all. Perhaps you've heard that expression in relation to the soldiers who have served our country for many years. Some soldiers loved their freedom so much and the things that we stand for that they gave their very life to preserve those things so that we can enjoy them. In the Bible, we see a similar situation in our relation to sin. We are slaves of sin, the Bible says. And God loved us so much that He wanted to give His Son so that we could have the freedom from sin. And John 3.16 makes that abundantly clear that God so loved us that He gave His only begotten Son. And all that we must do to have eternal life is to believe in Him. But also in that sacrifice, there is a body of believers that Jesus purchased with His blood. Paul writes in Acts 20 verse 28, that he, ex he exhorts the, the elders there to be shepherds of the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. When Paul is writing in Ephesians chapter 5, he fast forwards to the concept of the blood-bought institution called the church in Acts chapter 20. And he exhorts husbands to love your wives, Ephesians 5.25. And the next words that he uses are interesting. Husbands, love your wives just as, or some translations say, even as Christ loved the church. Husbands, that's a steep call for us because we are called to love our wives. We are called to give all for them, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Husbands, do you love your wives just as Christ loved the church? willing and any opportunity to give all for her. Your time, talents, resources, financial resources, and even if it calls for it, your own life. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. If we love our wives as Christ loved the church, we are well on our way to being the husbands that God wants us to be. We're back for our discussion with uh, David Smith and Jameson Stewart. Uh, we're talking about the prodigal son, every Christian parent's greatest fear. You know, parents make mistakes. We've already acknowledged that in our discussion. And, you, you know, we can, can do things or say things that can contribute to our child's uh, going astray. Uh, of course, we recognize that we could be the best, perfect parents in the world, and children can still go astray. But sometimes parents can make mistakes after the fact, uh, regardless of why their children leave. They, they make mistakes in their parenting after their child has gone astray. And these mistakes can contribute to a child remaining in apostasy, remaining a, uh, a prodigal son or prodigal daughter. I want us to think about that for just a moment. What are some mistakes parents can make after the fact? I think a, a couple that come to my mind are a couple of mistakes are one, it's sort of making excuses, you know, for their child's decision, sort of maybe almost justifying it. You know, they've, you know, they've really faced a lot of tough things okay. in their life. They've had this happen with their family and mm. you know, they got laid off their jobs, you know, right. and so maybe because they then went down this road and, you know, it's, it, they wouldn't have done that if this, you know, make mm -hmm. excuses for it. Another option is that sometimes regret, regrettably happens is sort of compromising what the word of God says about okay. maybe whatever path their child has gone down to make themselves feel better. Maybe about, well, maybe this isn't that bad. Um, those are two things that came to my mind thinking about that. All right, let's think about those two specific areas for just a moment. David, what are your thoughts? You know, the first thing that came to my mind, and I'm sure you've mentioned on programs before, this just as a practical application of that, is what I see happen on Facebook quite often. 
you'll see parents and you'll see their kids and the kids are making terrible life decisions. And in my mind, I think of mm-hmm. one where um, a, a child of, of a parent who's a Christian and the child was also a Christian mm-hmm. decided that he was going to uh, change his um, sexual uh, preference and become homosexual. And I remember seeing distinctly the parent post mm-hmm. on the Facebook page, so proud of you. Mm. And the fear of the parent was, well, if I don't endorse it, I'm going to, I'll lose that child forever. They'll never talk to me again. And I, I think of Romans one thirty two, mm. you know, where at the end of talking about bad behavior, he then turns his attention to those who endorse the bad yeah. behavior. And I understand the fears, right? You don't want to be in a position where your kids never talk to you again. Um, but I've, you know, I, I've always tried to, as a parent, I live by Hebrews eleven seven. Noah saved his family. I can lose the world. I don't care. I just want to get my wife and kids to heaven. That's all I care about. And so I think we have to be of a mind to say we'll do whatever's necessary to to get them there, um, even if it means strong conversations mm-hmm. and hard talks, and uh, if we have to change our association for a little bit to 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 make that work. But yeah, um, endorsement is not a good thing. Yeah, and and I think it kind of relates to the idea of being an enabler. Yeah. Uh, you know, someone who enables a behavior. I mean, we can do that in different ways, can't we? Sure. Enable. Yeah, we can, you know, maybe by sort of wavering a bit on is this wrong or not. Yeah. Uh, you and, sort of encourage that behavior to continue in doing that. Yeah, and, and I've known of individuals who uh, even were very active in the church, maybe people who were preachers in the church who would teach very sound doctrine re- regarding different subjects, for example, marriage and divorce and remarriage. And then they would have a child who might find themselves in a uh, unscriptural marriage, and all of a sudden their theology, that is the parents' theology, changes mm-hmm. overnight, you know, in, in order to, to seek to justify that particular relationship. And, and that's so very dangerous because... Uh, we're going to be judged based upon what the Word of God says, sure. not based upon how we can uh, devise it to fit, you know, who we are, who we want to be, and who our children want to be. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, like David pointed out, our, our greatest responsibility as a parent is to make sure our children go to heaven and, and by endorsing or by being an enabler, uh, and and we do want to affirm them that we love them, but you do not want to give the impression that you're okay with the choice they're making in this area of their life because we become an enabler. Mm-hmm. What are some other thoughts along that line as far as mistakes? Jameson, you, you hit on uh, two there. Um, let's talk about the other one for just a moment. Well, and we had sort of talked about compromising what the Word of yep. God says to really, I guess, make yourself feel better. But also, it's, you know, making excuses. You know, there's this idea that if my child has faced something, you know, they faced all this on the job. You know, they were mm-hmm. fired and they shouldn't have been fired. They've had all these bad things happen to them. Maybe people, you know, maybe they've left the church and, you know, they, they told me that the people at church, they just weren't as yeah. kind to them as they should have been. and really justify someone's sin because we'll look at all these bad things yeah. that happened to them to lead up to this point. Sure. But, and while all those things maybe shouldn't have happened to them, we've already mentioned it. We, yeah. we have free will. We have a choice to make and that doesn't allow you, you us. You know, to Jameson, make that. there's a, an illustration that I've used so many times and I've used it again here because it ties in perfectly with what you're you're, you're talking about here. There was a, a father, and he was an alcoholic. He was a drunkard in town. He was a reprobate, uh, and uh, he died. Uh, he had two sons, and uh, one of his sons uh, was an alcoholic, uh, was a drunkard, was a reprobate. And people in town said, well, what do you expect? His daddy was an alcoholic and a reprobate. He had another son. That son never touched the stuff. And people in town said, well, what do you expect? His daddy was an alcoholic and a reprobate. Mm -hmm. In other words, two children grew up in the same household. One used uh, their circumstances as a catalyst for uh, doing what's right, whereas the other one used it as an excuse. Sure. And we can do that in our parenting relationship 
as well. Um, real quickly, we just have just a, just a few seconds here left, but um, what, what's important for a child in, uh, to come back? Uh, when we look at that parable, what, what did that child do that, it, that our children must do or we must do if we're going to come back? He understood the nature of his father. I always think of 1 Peter chapter 3. You've got a non-Christian Christian situation, and it says even if you don't even speak another word, they without the word can still mm. be won by conduct. And I think parents just have to be consistent. You be faithful and let your faithfulness be a beacon for that child to, to come back to. It, it works. It's tough to be consistent and hold the line, but you've got to do it. Thank you for viewing The Fabric of Family. Flooding my soul with if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is 1031 Hermitage Drive in Florence, Alabama, 35630. Or you may contact us at our website, jhcc.org. That's jhcc.org. Flooding my soul with or you can call us at 256-764-6291. That's 256-764-6291. Mansions above, singing his praises, gladly I'm walking. Our hope and prayer is to bring you and your family closer to God. Our time just goes by so quickly, doesn't it? We've come to this time in our program in which uh, we want to offer to those who are viewing uh, a free Bible correspondence course. The information is going to be on your screen, and if you would have interest in that, again, it is free. No one's going to contact you. We're just simply going to send you the correspondence course, and you can fill it out, and you can send it in. It'll help you in your own private devotion and study in the Word of God. I want to thank those who have helped us in our program today, David and Jameson, and the great job that they have done in, in talking about this important subject. You know, there have been so many parents down through the years who have uh, lived out uh, this story in their own lives with their own children. They have had children who have played the role of a prodigal. Hopefully, the material that we have presented today has, has perhaps helped someone, maybe someone who's who's watching this program at this very moment. Fabric of Family is brought to you by Churches of Christ, and there are a number of congregations that are going to be scrolling across the screen, and we would invite you to visit with one of these congregations at your earliest convenience. Until next time, I'm Barry Gilreath, Jr., preacher for the Studs Road Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama, wishing you and your family Wonderful week. Again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. WJHFLP, share help and feedback. Screen recording in progress. What? Cellular. Screen recording in progress.